Peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would you please pray with me? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we know, you know how at times we make an ugly mess of our lives. But yet, Lord, we know that you love us. You have shown us that love in Jesus Christ. And through the forgiveness of those ugly sins, you make us beautiful once again. Keep us in your grace, for Jesus' sake. Amen. A reversal of fortune. I mean, think how many books have been written or movies have been made based on this simple plot. I mean, for as long as stories have been told, as long as books have been written, as long as movies have been made, this simple plot has inspired numerous stories. Not only from rags to riches, but from riches to rags. From obscurity to fame. From a railroad mogul to a total recluse. From an ugly duckling to a beautiful swan. Disney has made a fortune using this plot. He used to be a young man, young, handsome prince, living in a stately castle that was until the curse. An enchantress came by, dressed as a beggar woman, and turned him into an ugly animal, and his servants into household items. We're familiar with the names of these people, of the household items. Lumiere, Cogsworth, Mrs. Potts, and of course my favorite, the little teacup named Chip. But what did they name the prince? the beast. Why? Because he was repugnant and repulsive. He was hideous and homely and very, very hairy. He was so ashamed that he withdrew himself into his castle where he would see no one and see no, and, and, or anyone or anything. That was until one day when a beautiful young lady named Belle came by and strolled into his life and changed everything. Beauty loves the beast and the beast becomes beautiful. Have you ever felt like the beast in your life? You know, alone, by yourself, rejected, living in the shadows. You probably have. I mean, I have. I, I, and if we're honest, we all have. And frequently, we withdraw ourselves, hide in our own castles, not wanting anyone to see the mess that we've made of our lives. Well, Zion knows that feeling all too well. And by Zion, I mean God's people. The text for this morning, or this evening here, Isaiah 55 to 66 here, is from Isaiah 60, which is verses 4 to 9, which is a follow-on from last week, except the imagery changed. If you remember last week, we talked about enduring light, but today we're talking about beauty. And to understand why Isaiah makes that shift in imagery, we need to take a step back. Well, actually, we need to go back a chapter to chapter 59. It's, if you turn in your Bibles to page 736, you'll find chapter 59 of Isaiah. If you would scan through that chapter, what I want you to note is how many negative words Yahweh uses to describe Israel. 17 times in the first eight verses, God uses a negative word to describe Israel. Their moral decadence in which they lived. Some of those words that you come across are iniquity, sin, defilement, deceit, wickedness, disorder, vanity, turmoil, violence, evil, destruction, devastation, crooked. 
From there he goes on to say that salvation, that righteousness, that um, justice is nowhere to be found in Israel. It is far, far, far away. So that ultimately he ends chapter 59 by saying about Israel that he is appalled. Appalled that no one is there to intervene. That's pretty ugly, isn't it? But you can't hardly turn to a page in the Bible where the beast doesn't rear its ugly head. Cain murders Abel. Joseph is sold by his brothers into slavery. Moses kills a Hebrew. Ammon rapes Tamar. Joab kills Absalom. Herod murders all the babies in Bethlehem. And the other Herod beheads John the Baptist. I mean, even sweet little Asaph, the psalmist, declares in Psalm 73, he says, I was senseless. I was ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, O oh God. And though we have a million and one ways to deny the reality, <laughs> the truth is that the beast lives in all of us. We become defiant, rude, angry, and ugly. Lashing out in temper, we spew forth venomous words, making a mess of everything. Vowing to make a change, a week later, we're back at it again, lashing out with savage frenzy. I'm not a, don't think that I'm um, overstating this issue at all. I mean, dare take a look right now at your own life and see the pattern that your life is weaving. It can get ugly, can't it? Really, really ugly. But turning from chapter 59 into chapter 60 then, Isaiah the prophet, as we talked about last week, heard, he prophesies to them, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Light exposes the deeds of darkness. Light lets, doesn't let anything hide. And when it is the sun of righteousness that rises in our lives, then there is nothing in our lives that are hidden from him. But Isaiah's approach, as you noticed last week, wasn't to use light as a destroyer, but more as a healer. The light, as it enlightens our lives, does show our beastly side, but it also heals, thus bringing out that which is beautiful as well. So in Isaiah 60, he announces the beauty that this light brings. Notice the connection. Perfect light brings perfect beauty. Isaiah 60 verses 4 to 9 that we have for this evening then overflows with soaring, lyrical, beautiful language. We are told about... Midian, and Keter, and Nebaioth, and Tarshish, and Sheba, and Ephah, all arriving in Zion, making her gorgeous and graceful, glorious and stunning, stunningly grand. They come bringing the abundance of the seas, the wealth of nations, the abundance of young camels, the milk of the nations gold, silver, bronze, iron, juniper, cypress, maple, and frankincense. They bring the young camels of Midian and Ephah, the flocks of Keter, the rams of Nebaioth. So that at the end, Isaiah sums up this text by saying, the Holy One of Israel has made you beautiful. 
In Isaiah 61 and 62, he also gives Isaiah beauty instead of ashes and calls his city a crown of beauty. Beauty loves the beast and the beast becomes beautiful. But where does this good and perfect beauty come from? We know it can't come from this world or anything that has its origin in this world because this world is cursed. Sin has destroyed perfect beauty. There is nothing in this world that is perfect anymore that isn't subject to death and decay, especially as humans. We've all been hit with that ugly stick of sin. We make an ugly mess of our lives. But God does tell us about one who is more beastly than all the others. John reveals him in the book of Revelation. The beast of Revelation is none other than the father of lies. Satan himself, who was tossed out of heaven into the abyss of the world. And this enchanter then roams the earth looking for people's lives to destroy. The enchanter wrecks havoc on the earth, but he's really out looking for one particular person, the perfect one of Mary and Joseph. And note throughout his ministry how often the beast rises in the life of Jesus, tempting him in the wilderness, tempting his disciples to betray him, getting the people to choose Barabbas, inciting the crowds to chant, crucify him, anything he could to stop Jesus on his saving mission. The enchanter's goal was singular. Take the most perfectly beautiful person on earth and make him absolutely repugnant and totally repulsive. Isaiah even gets in on this when he writes, there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was disfigured beyond that of man and his form marred beyond the sons of man. It got ugly, didn't it? Really, really ugly. The legionnaire's whip was made with leather strips to which balls of lead and chips of bone were tied. The purpose was is easy, to shred the back beyond recognition. The crown of thorns was meant to create gashes in the skull to cake the hair with blood. The fists were to deform the face, and the nails were meant to disfigure the entire body as he twisted and turned and writhed in pain. Rome famously called it Morris Terpissima Cruces, the most utterly vile death of the cross. Golgotha was filled with rotting flinch and the stench of death Corpses hung there for days, sometimes weeks, often consumed by birds and animals. But this was where the savage human nature triumphed over the stunning beauty of the Father's only begotten Son. The bloody mess was beyond all analogies, all metaphors, all parallels. Words collapse under the atrocity of it all. Melito of Sardis famously writes, He who hung the earth in its place hangs there. He who fixed the heavens is fixed there. He who made all things fast is made fast upon a tree. The master has been insulted. God 
has been murdered. But, 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 says Mary Magdalene, I have seen the Lord. The Emmaus disciples said, didn't our hearts burn when he talked to us? Peter confessed that we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And St. Thomas climactically says, my Lord and my God. You see, the one who was made totally repulsive and absolutely repugnant for us because the sins of all of us, the sins of the world were put around him, have now been made perfectly beautiful once again in the resurrection, made perfect by Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, who makes us beautiful as well. Beauty loves the beast, and the beast becomes beautiful. In March of uh, 2011, I was um, taking a trip down 29th Street between Tyler and Mays Road on my motorcycle. No, I had my motor running. I was heading down the highway. I was looking for adventure and whatever would come my way. At least I thought so, because it came to a screeching halt very quickly. Because out of a side street, a young lady made a left-hand turn, and instead of turning into the center lane, went all the way to the outside lane, pushing me up against the curbing. I slammed on my brakes, my foot peg scraping the concrete there. I thought for sure I was going to go flying off the bike into the pedestrian sidewalk. But there was good news and bad news. The good news was that I was not hurt. The bad news was is she waved to me in a way that I will not imitate tonight. So what does a person do? Well, when you have 1,800 cc's of engine below you, you take off, right? And you catch up with them. You've been insulted. I stopped next to her at the stoplight there at Mays and 29th and reminded her of what she had just done. Um, <coughs> I wasn't meditating on the upward call of God and Jesus Christ at that time. <laughs> I said, how could you do such a thing like that? Give me such a wave when you were the one who almost knocked me off my motorcycle. That dirty, low-down, sorry excuse for a driver. Oh, I wanted to get the best of her. Um, that beast reared its ugly head inside of me. My blood boiled the rest of that trip, and it wasn't an enjoyable ride. But why did I do that? Why was I so upset? Why was I so eager to cast her into the deepest, darkest regions of hell? Truth be told, this is just one of a billion times that I've reacted to life by believing, behaving like a beast. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you and I lash out to maim and maul people with our deadly thoughts and our explosive words. But when we come to our senses, when we realize how ridiculous we were, then we have that temptation to withdraw and hide in our castle, embarrassed by the mess that we've made with our lives. Lost in that cycle of shame and disgrace. But don't. Don't do that. Please, please, please don't do that. Jesus has come to take away the ugliness 
of our lives. He has already taken that ugliness upon himself. He has already paid the penalty for those sins. He wants you to come to him so that he can get rid of that ugliness and replace it with the beauty of his grace and mercy. Because you see, there's no better beauty shop in all the earth than the place where God, Yahweh, comes to us to take away the ugliness of our lives and give us his grace and his mercy. In this place, God takes away your sin and revives the beauty of your life. Here is good news for all of us. Beauty loves the beast. And the beast becomes beautiful. Don't believe me? Just ask Zion. Perfect beauty. It's God's perfectly beautiful gift for you, for me, for the nations. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand and make confession of the faith